I'm Nicole Helregal. No worries about the name, it's a tricky one. Um, and today I'm gonna to be focusing specifically on undergraduates and um, primarily instruction um, as a context for reaching them. A tiny bit of background about me, I work at Purchase College, which is a small liberal arts in the SUNY system. And um, I come at this from the area of a science librarian, which I have been um, for many years now. Okay, let's see. All right, um, so why undergraduates? Um, in looking at the program today, I don't know that we'll have too many other folks who are specifically looking at this population, so I felt it was important to talk about. I think um, getting in there early and um, creating that culture is really important um, so that <laughs> then we're not trying to sort of retroactively get people to think about it um, later on or coming up against uh, bad habits or, um, predisposition against thinking about some of these things. Also, I think some of it fits in really well with sort of broader undergraduate um, information and data literacies that a lot of us are focused on. And then lastly, um, a lot of folks or a lot of institutions now are really highlighting um, undergraduate research, uh, my current and previous institutions included. Um, so I think it's an important area to talk about with undergraduates who are doing that work. And then I also think, you know, this isn't limited to an instruction context, but I'm choosing to focus on it today because um, one, access, it's how I see most of the students that I see in my departments. Um, hand in hand with that is scale. So getting the, these ideas out to as many students as possible. And then lastly, I think there's a lot of value in sort of the discussion that comes out around a lot of these issues in the classroom that I think might not arise in more one-to-one um, -one interactions via um, reference. Okay. Um, so I did want to um, touch on um, how these issues relate to the framework because I think for a lot of us that is um, part and parcel of our sort of instructional presence um, with our undergraduates and I think you know arguments could be made for a lot of the uh, frames being related to these issues but these three have been the most um, sort of central to what I've been doing um, in my instruction. So with information creation as a process, I think a lot of what I'm doing, especially with my science students, is getting them to see that whole research cycle as a series of decisions and then the sort of information creation also as a series of decisions that has, you know, things that impact it, um, different systems, as was so lovely spelled out um, by our keynote speaker, um, different systems, different, um, you know, systems of value and influence and, and what impact those have on information creation and research. Um, and then, right, talking about sort of the process of scholarly publishing and communication, perhaps not amazingly in depth, but just to give them a sense, just because I think that is often something that's very unclear to people outside of <laughs> the scholarly publishing and communication world. So getting them just to critically evaluate all of these systems and processes in light of reproducibility and replication um, and their effects on then the information itself. Um, and then obviously very tied up with that is the information has value. So just, right, all of these systems have economic implications. So um, exploring that a little bit in terms of what gets published, what doesn't, what gets shared, what doesn't, um, what is open <laughs> and what is not and how that's different than free and things like that. Um, as well as when students are you know, doing undergraduate research, making sure that they do have at least a basic understanding of their intellectual property rights, um, sort of how that interplays with open access, open data, and things like that. And then lastly, um, introducing them to some of the cultural norms, especially within their specific subject area. That's been something that has even been a learning curve for me because I mostly work with science departments, but 
um, a few years ago on an interim basis, worked with a lot of social scientists. And yes, the difference, one of the later talks is, will be about this more and I'm really excited for it. But introducing students to that, I think can be really helpful too. Um, and then, right, scholarship is conversation. So, and the last thing kind of fits in this too, but just reproducibility and replication as a necessary part of the conversation as um, elements that both sort of bolster sometimes, but also challenge um, in other areas, um, the knowledge that is being entered into the conversation. So getting them to see that and talking about things like retractions, but I think oftentimes, you know, perhaps their only awareness of this kind of thing might be through a very, you know, salacious retraction uh, story, which can be interesting, but also just talking about like the full spectrum of the ways that scholars engage with each other and can work to be in conversation is important in this area. Okay, so um, the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about specific examples of what this looks like in practice within instruction that I already do. Um, and thinking about how it's scaffolded into a curriculum. I think there's a great place for like individual workshops and courses on this. Um, but in my experience, this is how I've been doing it in terms of integrating it into things that I'm already doing um, and how that's been helpful. So first off, sort of a basic writing or research course um, that a lot of us I think uh, have, who do instruction have a presence in. A lot of what I do in those courses, we do some searching and then we do, of course, evaluating. There's a, a big push for that among our writing instructors. So evaluating for authority, um, for credibility, for potential bias. And this is across lots of different kinds of sources. Um, but usually what I have them do in groups is evaluate a few different types of sources, including a peer reviewed study. And then one of the questions that we get into is, um, is there any reason that the author could be biased or is there anything that could have influenced what the author wrote, which is really a more broad way to put it. <laughs> um, and normally the students, you know, they work in small groups and they come back with answers about sort of, well, the author has, you know, a PhD in this, so they're probably using that lens to interrogate the issue. Sometimes they bring up like the institutional affiliation of the author and how that might have Affect things occasionally they talk about funding <laughs> um, but yeah when we when we come back together and we're talking about what they found one of the things I really like to bring up here that relates is sort of um, the incentives around being published right both within academia and um, in the journals themselves uh, I talk a little bit usually about like the publication biased against null results um, I usually don't use the phrase null results but right talking about like oh if something is wow we really proved this thing or um, which is problematic in itself but versus well it didn't really turn out like we thought which do you think is going to get published and then yes I also talk a lot about um, research funding and how that can potentially impact uh, both what gets highlighted and then also what gets published. Um, and then for the more like mid to upper level subject specific courses, uh, again, I often spend some time talking about subject specific searching, but then my instructors always want me to talk about evaluation as well. And in this case, you know, less so with just like, is this a decent source and more in depth, identifying different parts of the article, looking at the methodology and saying, is this appropriate, you know, methodology to tackle this question? Is it well applied here? Is the analysis appropriate? Um, so along with that, I think an easy activity to do is to present them with a study and say, okay, in small groups, what would you need to do? What information would you need to reproduce the study? Or what would you need to do? And what might be hindering you in terms of the, what they've provided? So transparency about methods, you know, really pulling out from them. Can you get the same software and computing set up? Is the metadata clear? Like, what would you do? What would your steps be? 
um, I think is a really good way to just get them thinking about that. And then lastly, obviously, um, at my institution, all of the seniors have to do a research project uh, capstone. So a lot of them are collecting original data. So this is where I really want that training within the senior seminar course of how to make their own research more reproducible and replicable. So well-documented and accessible data, methods, et cetera, um, talking about some of those questionable research practices and making sure that we're, <laughs> that's not baked in from the very beginning. Um, and then possibly even um, an idea I have is to do like a, a pre-registration type thing in the context of the natural and social science research symposium we have here. That has not come to fruition. That's like a dream of mine. Um, but just to get them doing that at the institutional level and thinking about how that might be valuable. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap up in the interest of time, but um, I did link on my last slide, which as was stated, all the slides will be shared to some resources specifically about teaching reproducibility. Some of them are about teaching undergraduates. None of them are mine. They're all by fantastic other people. Um, <laughs> but I have links to those. I also just want to take the time to say if other people are interested in these topics as they relate to undergraduates, please contact me because I'm definitely interested in doing um, more work in this area. Thanks so much.